जी अल्लाह मैंने शैतवान जी बिस्मिल्लाह रहमान रहीम टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट आवर वेबिनार एंड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक एंड द डेंगी एंड द चिल्ड्रन ऑल ओवर द पाकिस्तान देयर इज ए ऑलमोस्ट नॉट वी कैन नॉट से पेंडेमिक बट बट देयर इज अ स्प्रेड ऑफ द इन दिस वेदर स्पेशली द पीक सीजन इज अक्टूबर and uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dr amreen sultan is the graduate of the ayu medical college in from 1992 and she is a uh, member of the uh, uh, fellowship and uh, 2001 she is a very competent uh, pediatrician and dr amreen uh, is working in the benazir shaheed teaching hospital and this teaching hospital is the largest teaching hospital uh, it was called once the dhq this is attached with the uh, women medical and dental college uh, of the abdabad under the leadership of professor dr salma kondi and dr azhar jadoon and uh, before starting today's webinar uh, we apologize that because uh, due to weather there may be some disconnection and we all see that there was a break uh, of some time but any of uh, after that we will continue this uh, webinar continuously every week at 11 am and not over to you to uh, dr professor rashid saab uh, is our uh, uh, colleague since we started this webinar in 2021 over to you uh, rashid saab oh, okay sir jazakallah bahut shukriya ജറാദല ये सूरत अराफ की आयत थी वन थर्टी थ्री इसमें अल्लाह ताला की तरफ से जो अजाब नाजिल हुए हैं उनका जिक्र है चुनाचे हमने उन पर तूफान चिड़ियों घन के कीड़ों मेंढकों और खून की बुलाएं छोड़ी जो सब अलहदा अलहदा निशानियां थी फिर भी उन्होंने तकबर का मुजाहरा किया और वो बड़े मुजरम लोग थे ये डेंगी कोरोना और इस किस्म की चीजें हैं ये हमारे ऊपर अल्लाह ताला की तरफ से अजाब है अल्लाह ताला हमें अपनी आजमाइश महफूज रखे सौदीम हॉस्पिटल beautiful hospital with uh, of the bayazi shaheed teaching hospital and also you have your own hospital you try to engage your teachers to give the webinars uh, weekly and here over to you dr uh, amreen sultan for thanks today's uh... thanks very much thanks very much for this nice introduction um, today's topic is dengue infection in children uh i apologize for the quality of my voice because i'm full of cold but i'll try my best to convey the message this will be the outline of my webinar there has been alternative names of dengue fever in the past like brayfone fever philippine hemorrhagic fever hemorrhagic fever dengue shock syndrome thai hemorrhagic fever and singapore hemorrhagic fever If you look into the history, dengue epidemics are known to have occurred over the last three centuries in tropical, subtropical, and temperate zones. The first epidemic of dengue was recorded in 1635 in French West Indies. Rush described about breadborne fever in Philadelphia in 
the first recorded outbreak of dengue hemorrhagic fever occurred in Australia in 1897. Similar disease was found in Greece in 1928 and in Taiwan in 1931. First confirmed epidemic of dengue hemorrhagic fever was recorded in Philippines in 1953 till 1954. Now it's prevalent in India, Indonesia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, countries of West Pacific region, and in Pakistan since 1980s onward. This is epidemiology of dengue fever. There are 2.5 billion people at risk worldwide. 50 million new cases annually worldwide, 500,000 patients are hospitalized every year, and 2.5% of the affected patients die. Uh, this is a bit blurred picture of the world map. Uh, I could only get this one. I apologize for that. So these yellow areas are areas infested with Aedes aegypti, and red areas are areas with Aedes aegypti and dengue epidemic activity. So this, this area is occupied by China, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. And this is the area occupied by Africa, and this is South America. So these are the countries where this disease is has got high prevalence. I've got this map for year 2022 uh, for Pakistan, when there was a flood, and these blue areas show the flood activity. And if you can see the maximum number of cases which were in the same were in the flooded area, which correlates with the um, infection of uh, dengue fever and uh, production or uh, spread of Aedes aegypti. Then second number was Punjab, then Hebe Pakhtunkhwa, and then Lochistan. I've got this uh, IDS RS uh, system, which is public health section for notification of dengue fever. And I've got this data from January till November. So these are the high risk area. And this is the data showing here that Peshawar has maximum number of cases since January, which is 1,211. Then is Mansera, And then third number is for Abitabar. And then if you look at the rest of the cities, the number is decreasing. So up till now, we have got total number of 3,487 patients, confirmed patients of dengue this year in Hyper Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, this uh, table underneath shows the data admitted patients for November 7. So we had one patient in a youth teaching hospital, Abbottabad, one at Benazir Bhutto, Shaheed Hospital, Abbottabad on 7th of November, and one at DHQ Hospital, Moshara. This is the map of Khaber Pakhtunkha, and it shows total confirmed cases of, uh, on between January 1st, 2024, till 7th of November, and the high risk area where more than 500 cases were reported during this time was Peshawar. Then moderate risk was Abitawar, Mansera, and Mardan. And if you look at this map underneath it, this shows the confirmed cases in week 44th, which is from 28th of October till November of 3rd, 3rd November of 2024. So we have got more than 50 cases in Noshera and Peshawar and Abitawar. And then moderate risk is for Mansera, Mardan, and Charsada. So they, the, this data shows that how closely this disease is monitored in our trans province as well as in the rest of the provinces of Pakistan. Now, introduction of dengue virus. It is an arbovirus. There are four antigenic types. We all know dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4. It is transmitted by two types of mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus which is a daytime biting mosquito. All four virus types have been recovered from it. Dengue two and three virus strains are associated with a particularly severe clinical syndrome. This is the dengue virus. So there is a single-stranded RNA in the center, and then there's capsid protein, and this is the outer structure of the virus. Vector is uh, uh, mosquitoes of the Stigomyia family, which are Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These mosquitoes also transmit Zika virus, yellow fever virus, chikungunya virus, and malaria parasite. So this is a picture of four types. They have got striped legs. These mosquitoes breed in fresh water that is stored for drinking, bathing, rainwater collected in any container, Dengue outbreaks in areas infested with Aedes aegypti may be explosive. Up to 70 to 80% of population may be involved. 
most of the disease occurs in older children and adult. Now, dengue fever is a benign syndrome caused by dengue virus and is characterized by high grade fever, myalgia, arthralgia, rash, leukopenia, and lymph node enlargement. Dengue should be suspected when a high fever is accompanied by two of the symptoms in the early febrile phase, which are severe headache, retroorbital pain, muscle and joint pain, nausea, vomiting, lymphadenopathy, and rash. Dengue hemorrhagic fever is a severe fatal febrile disease characterized by fever for two to seven days. Then there are hemorrhagic manifestation, may be minor or major, thrombocytopenia less than 100,000 per millimeter cube. And there should be evidence of increased capillary permeability by racematocrit above 20% of the baseline and then pleural effusion and ascites. Hypoadenomenemia would be present. Dengue shock syndrome is the worst picture of dengue hemorrhagic fever and its criteria include dengue hemorrhagic fever plus tachycardia, hypotension, narrow, narrow pulse pressure, signs of poor perfusion, cold extremities, which are the signs of shock. This is classification of WHO done in 2009 uh, according to the severity. So WHO has classified into uh, dengue without warning signs, dengue with warning signs, and then severe dengue. So probable dengue when a patient is living in or traveling from the dengue endemic area and presents with fever and two of the criteria between nausea, vomiting, rash, aches and pains, two negative positive tests, leukopenia, any warning sign and laboratory confirmation of uh, dengue. Warning signs are abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleeds, lethargy, restlessness, patumatily, and hematocrit increase with rapid decrease of platelet count. Criteria for severe dengue is severe plasma leakage leading to dengue shock syndrome, fluid accumulation with respiratory distress, severe bleeding, and severe organ damage. Uh, it could be liver damage, it could be CNS impairment, it could be kidney damage, altered consciousness, heart and other organs involvement. Now, WHO has given a grading of dengue virus infection as well. So simple dengue fever, when there is only fever for two or, with two or more of the signs which I have discussed earlier on, headache, retroorbital pain, myalgia, thralgia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. Then dengue hemorrhagic fever is divided into four grades. Grade one is fever plus positive tourniquet tests and platelets of less than 100,000 per millimeter cube and hematocrit tries of 20% above the baseline. Then dengue hemorrhagic fever grade two is all of the above criteria plus spontaneous bleeding. Grade three and grade three four are, uh, grade three and grade four are classified as de dengue shock syndrome, where there will be fever of dengue hemorrhagic fever plus circulatory failure. And then in dengue four, there will be profound shock. Now, natural course of the dengue viral infection, it's good to know that 80 to 90% of cases will remain asymptomatic and undiagnosed. And only 10% patient will present to a clinician, maybe pediatrician or general physician. So out of those 10%, some will have undifferentiated fever. Some will go for the picture of dengue fever with or without bleeding. And only a minor proportion will go for dengue hemorrhagic fever with plasma leakage. Out of those, this small portion, 98% will be classified as grade one and grade two without any shock. And only one to 2% of those will have grade three and four, which means that they will have shock. And then there is less than 1% uh, number of the cases where there will be dengue expanded syndrome, which will involve organ failure. It could be liver failure, it could be renal failure, or it could be respiratory failure. Now, natural course of dengue fever, there is a febrile phase of high fever for two to seven days. There is no critical phase in dengue fever. fever. And then there will be convalescent phase of two to five days, which can be longer in adults. Natural course of dengue hemorrhagic fever will have febrile phase similar to the dengue fever. But then there will be a critical phase of plasma leakage, which lasts for 24 to 48 hours, usually on day five and day six, but it could be earliest on day three. 
then there will be a convalescent phase of two to five days, which again could be longer in the adults. Looking into pathogenesis of dengue fever, it's not clear, but uh, there are postulated um, theories about primary dengue infection as well as for secondary dengue infection. We will look into the pathogenesis of uh, primary dengue infection first. There is rapid activation of complement system shortly before or during shock, blood levels of soluble tumor necrosis factor increase. There is a role of interferon gamma, interleukin 2 are elevated as well. C3 catabolic rates are elevated. C1, Q, C4, C5, C8, and C3 co-activators are depressed. These factors may interact at endothelial level to produce increased vascular permeability through the nitric oxide final pathway. The blood clotting and fibrinolytic system are activated as well, and levels of uh, factor 12, which is Heckman factor, are depressed. Then there is another theory that it could be due to direct damage of glycocalyx of endothelial cell membrane by virus itself and its non-structural antigen 1. Now, pathogenesis of secondary infection is quite interesting, and it is uh, labeled as antibody-dependent enhancement. There is circulation of infection enhancing antibodies at the time of infection, which are greatest risk factor for development of severe disease. There is rapid activation of complement system, capillary damage, internal redistribution of fluid resulting in hemoconcentration, hypovolemia, increased cardiac work, load, tissue hypoxia, metabolic acidosis, and hyponatremia. So this is a very good picture of uh, um, intravascular and extravascular space. In normal person, intravascular space will have 25% of the fluid, body fluid, which will be mostly plasma, and then extravascular fluid will only come for 75%. In dengue, dengue patient, this balance is uh, disturbed. So there will be leakage of the plasma in extravascular space. Plasma will account for only 10% in intravascular space and inter extravascular fluid will increase up to 90%. That is the main pathophysiological event in critical phase of the dengue fever, a dengue hemorrhagic fever. Severity of disease depends on age, previous infection, virus strain. Dengue virus one strain results in a minor illness as compared to dengue two, dengue three, and dengue four. Post genetics matter, pre existing anti dengue antibodies have got an effect, and maternal antibodies in the infants. Uh, incubation period is approximately six days, average of six days, and ranges between three to 14 days. There is an ex extrinsic incubation period and intrinsic incubation period. So, as a dengue virus infected person is bitten by the mosquito, that uh, mosquito will ingest dengue virus meal and then uh, dengue virus will replicate in the mosquito for eight to 12 days before being able to transmit virus to the next person. When another person is bitten by the infected mosquito, then dengue virus is transmitted to that person and it replicates that human for three to 14 days before the onset of symptoms. In the features in young children, the disease may be undifferentiated, are characterized by fever for one to five days. They will only experience symptoms similar to those of common cold and gastroenteritis. In older children and adults, there is sudden onset of fever with temperature rise of up to 40 degrees centigrade, usually accompanied by frontal or retroorbital pain, particularly when the pressure is applied to the eyes. There is severe back pain because its name is breakbone fever. A rash occurs in approximately 50 to 80 percent. It could be simple flush skin or it could be uh, Isle of Whites in the Red Sea, whose picture I will show you in next slides. Later in the course of illness, there could be a measles like rash, which could be macular papillar, and there could be hemorrhagic manifestations like the TTA. Dengue in infants differs from the adult presentation, fits are more common. Leukocytosis uh, is present rather than leukopenia. They are more prone to electrolyte imbalance, particularly of sodium. Upper respiratory and GI features predominate, more prone to plasma leak, but for shorter duration. Hepatomegaly and deranged LFTs are more common in infants. So this is the uh, diagrammatic representation of dengue fever symptoms. So in the febrile phase, fever, headache, mouth and nose bleeding, 
muscle and joint pains, vomiting, rash and diarrhea. In physical phase, there could be hypertension, pleural effusion, ascites, gastrointestinal bleeding. In recovery phase, there could be altered level of consciousness, fierce itching, and slow heart rate. This is the typical rash of eyes of white in Red Sea. This is the picture showing how to uh, perform capillary refill time. It is basically done by applying pressure to the nail for five seconds until the nail blanches. And then it is released and you count uh, number of seconds, uh, what time the color reappears, pink color reappears. Pink color should reappear before you count less than two or it should be less than two seconds. If it is two seconds or more, then it means there is delayed capillary refill and it's a very good measure of peripheral perfusion and evidence of shock. Investigations, uh, full blood count as a baseline for hemoglobin level, TLC, DLC platelets and hematocrit. PCR, PCR is a diagnostic test which could be performed in first three days. It's 100% sensitive and specific, but it is not available here for technical reasons as well as for the reason of uh, uh, cost. Then second best available test to us is NS1 antigen detection. It could be detected in first five days of the illness. Its sensitivity is 60 to 90%. And then dengue antibodies. IgM is detectable on five to six days after the onset of illness. And dengue uh, and IgG is available on day 14 of illness in primary infection and day two in the secondary infection. Then chest x-rays, ultrasound abdomen in chest, serum cholesterol, and albumin. I recorded a little video for NS1 antigen strip immunochromatography test to show you. So this is a finger prick test at bedside level. Finger is pricked and then small dropper. Blood is sucked. This drop of blood is inserted into this strip, a device. And then one drop of buffer is added. You have to wait for 10 minutes, but I won't go that long. This device has got two letters on it, C and T. C is for control and T is for transmitted case or transmitted sample. So if there is only one line, after 10 minutes on the C level, it means it's negative test. And if there are two lines, one at control and one at transmitted level, then it is NS1 antigen positive case. So one line has appeared here at control level but there is no line at the T level. So it's a negative NS1 antigen test. So I actually waited for 10 minutes, but I won't go that long here in this presentation. Okay, now. Now, diagnostic comparison and merits of the test. So this is virus isolation by virus culture. And this is highly specific and sensitive test, but it's not available and it's very expensive. This is genome detection by PCR. Again, it is very highly specific and sensitive test, but very expensive and not available to us. This is antigenic detection, which whose video we have seen. And it's, uh, it has got moderate sensitivity and specificity, and it lasts for only five days. Then assays are available for IgM serology and IgG serology, which are indirect methods of diagnosis of dengue fever. Virological and serological markers of dengue according to the time of illness. So it's important to understand this. When there is primary infection, there is rise of IgM level, which can which will last for 14 days. 
then after the first week of illness, there will be rise of IgG levels and it will stay there lifelong. It will give lifelong immunity to that serotype only, not for rest of the three serotypes of dengue virus. If there is secondary infection with a heterotypic virus, there will be a small rise of IgM antibodies, but there will be marked elevation of IgG. Now, how to interpret dengue serology? Uh, this is the table, it's uh, very useful. IgM, if IgM is negative and IgG is negative, so it could be early sample or it's not dengue. If IgM is negative, but there is low teeter of positive IgG, then it's past dengue infection. If IgM is negative, but there's very high teeter of IgG, then this is secondary dengue infection. If IgM is positive, but IgG is negative, it's primary dengue infection. If IgG is positive, but there's low teeter of IgG, then it could be current a recent primary dengue infection when there is start of IgG production. If IgM is positive, but very high teeters of IgG, then this is secondary dengue infection. Differential diagnosis in early stage of the disease, viral respiratory influenza-like diseases, early stages of malaria, viral hepatitis, enteric fever, meningococcemia, yellow fever, and other viral hemorrhagic fevers should be considered. Now, dengue fever versus dengue hemorrhagic fever. It's important to differentiate these two clinical conditions from beginning of the illness. Though they look very similar on the day, on the first two days. However, badly managed dengue fever will never become dengue hemorrhagic fever. Patients in the critical phase are concerned to be dengue hemorrhagic fever if they have got fever beyond the three. Platelet count drops to 100,000 per millimeter cube and lower than that, and WBC count of less than five. There is evidence of plasma leak by plural or peritoneal, peritoneal effusions. There is metrograde rise of 20% from the baseline. There is hypoalbuminemia and low cholesterol and other major or minor hemorrhagic manifestations. Now, diagnosis and management, management of out, at outpatient level. It's important to understand and consider that there is no specific treatment of dengue infection. Treatment is only supportive and symptomatic, and its aim is not to miss the complications in critical phase. When to suspect dengue fever, dengue hemorrhagic fever in a child, if there is acute onset of fever in a patient who is living in or traveling from an endemic area, plus there are two signs which I have discussed earlier on as well, um, that could include headache, retroorbital pain, nausea, vomiting, Arthematis, macular, petechial, itchy rash, arthralgia, myalgia, leukopenia, positive to a test. Negative test does not exclude possibility of dengue. And platelet count of less than 150,000 per millimeter cube and rising in for 5 to 10% above baseline. This is to a test. It's a very simple test. You have to inflate blood pressure cuff between systolic and diastolic pressure, and you keep it there for five minutes. After five minutes, you release the pressure, and after one minute of releasing pressure, you count petechial hemorrhages in the antecubital fossa. If there are 10 or more petechial hemorrhages in one square inch of the area of antecubital fossa, then this is positive to mutate us. Now, management of those patients who do not need admission. So you need to ensure adequate oral fluid intake, adequate physical rest, Paracetamol is pre prescribed and 10 to 15 milligram per kg per dose of the fever, uh, per dose for the fever. You need to avoid all NSAIDs and steroids and you have to review the patient daily. A full blood count must be done on third day of illness or earlier if the clinical situation warrants. If the first count is normal, may have to repeat count depending on clinical situation. And most important message or advice you need to give to the patient is prevent spread of dengue within the household and surroundings. So you need to advise them to uh, eradicate mosquitoes from the house with sprays, whatever they want to use, where, wherever there is stagnant water, you need to advise them to remove it or cover those utensils. And you need to advise them to use bed nets for at least initial febrile phase.
you need to give them advice when to return immediately. So these are the features when they should be asked to return immediately. When there is clinical deterioration with settling a fever, inability to tolerate oral fluid, patient refuses to eat or drink, feeling extremely thirsty, severe abdominal pain or vomiting, cold and clammy extremities, bleeding manifestations, not passing urine for more than six hours, and any behavioral changes like confusion, lethargy, restlessness, or irritability. Now, criteria for admission. All patients with platelet count of less than 100,000 per millimeter cube, platelet count above 100,000 per millimeter cube, but below 150,000 per millimeter cube, and dropping rapidly may be admitted depending on the circumstances. So all patients who have got warning signs of abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, signs of shock, clinical fluid accumulation, and mucosal bleeding should be admitted. Now warning signs for suspected dengue hemorrhagic fever, which will warrant admission for intense and close monitoring. So that could be uh, altered level of consciousness, consciousness, liver enlargement of more than two centimeters, Increase in hematocrit of more than 10% baseline. Decrease in platelet count more than, sorry, less than 100,000 per millimeter cube. And elevated SUT well above SUT. Now, some, there are some other categories of dengue who should be admitted as well. And those are infants, obese patients, patients with major comorbidities like diabetes, nephrotic syndrome, hemolytic disease, poorly controlled asthma. And you should always look for adverse social circumstances where patient is living alone, living far from healthcare facility without reliable means of transport and unreliable parents. Now, most important treatment or management is food man management in critical phase. So initially during first two days, uh, dengue shock is extremely rare and there is no leakage. You can give fluid freely, oral fluid. Give the normal maintenance or more as replacement if there is vomiting and diarrhea and give electrolyte solution rather than plain water, which means ORS. In critical phase, which will start after day three, then patient may start leaking anytime. Now don't ask to drink plenty of fluids. There is uh, some role of fluid restriction. Look for signs of leaking, like plated dropping of uh, below 100,000 per millimeter cube. It's important to note that critical phase is only 48 hours. So final outcome, morbidity, morbidity mortality, will largely depend on fluid, fluid management of critical phase. How to confirm that patient is in critical phase? So there will be evidence of leaking from pleural effusions and, and in ascites in the peritoneal cavities. Edema, facial puffiness, leg, arm swelling are not suggestive of leaking, but are suggestive of fluid overload. Then you can perform right lateral decubitus chest x-ray, ultrasound of chest and abdomen, serum albumin levels below 3.5 gram percent and serum cholesterol level below than 100 milligram percent. So this is right decubitus chest x-ray, which shows an accumulation of fluid. And this is in the uh, pleural cavity. Now you can identify leak phase by using clinical parameters. This is the chart, uh, which is uh, provided by WHO. Obviously, if you are admitting a patient with dengue hemorrhagic fever, you have to have four hourly vital recordings. So it is recording temperature, heart rate, capillary fill time, blood pressure, pulse pressure, and respiratory rate. And if you can see here, pulse pressure was 50 initially and it's dropping continuously until it is arrow points to 25 and 20. And then heart rate is increasing from baseline to 96 and so on. So this is the point where there is narrowing of pulse pressure and there is leak phase. When to suspect significant occult bleeding? If hematocrit is not as high as expected for the degree of shock to be explained by plasma leakage alone. A drop in hematocrit without clinical improvement, despite adequate fluid replacement. Severe metabolic acidosis and end organ dysfunction, despite adequate fluid replacement. So these are the cases 
It means that if your patient is not responding to your fluid, adequate fluid management, then you must suspect that there is some complication and commonly it could be upper bleeding. Now, fluid management in dengue. Once patient is in critical phase, total fluids are calculated as maintenance fluid plus 5% of deficit over the entire critical phase of 48 hours. This is how you calculate total fluids uh, for critical phase. Initial of these uh, calculation of fluid is the same as you calculate maintenance fluid for anybody. It doesn't matter what is the age, what is the weight of the patient. So it counts for adults as well as for children as well. For first 100 ml per kg, you always give, for first 10 kgs, you always give 100 ml per kg. For next 10 kgs, you give 50 ml per kg. And for rest of the balance weight, whatever it is, you give 20 ml per kg. This is normal calculation of maintenance fluid in anybody. And for critical period of dengue fever, you add 5% of body weight, which is equal to 50 ml per body weight in kgs. So what kind of fluid should be given? So you always start with crystallized and it's, it's management is the same as for any hypovolemic shock patient. So crystallized use could be simple 9% saline, which is normal saline, or 5% dextrose plus normal saline. In less than six months of age, it's preferable to use 5% dextrose with half normal saline. Then in polides, albumin, dextrin, 40, and uh, Hartman solution, these could be used. Rate of infusion of polar should be 10 mils per kg per hour. Half bolus is given in 30 minutes. And if you are thinking that patient needs full bolus, then it should be given in six, 60 minutes. Polars could be dextrin-based, hydroxyethyl starch, gelatin-based solutions. So there are some advantages as well as some disadvantages that we use. Advantage is that they restore BP very fast. They restore the cardiac index and reduce level of hematocrit faster than crystallized in patients with intractable shock and where pulse pressure is less than 10 millimeter of mercury. Disadvantages are that uh, they can have an impact on coagulation, they can have allergic reaction, they can damage kidney in hypovolemic patients. They theoretically dextran binds to one milligram factor uh, of coagulation and it can impair coagulation further, but it's not observed in uh, to have any clinical significance in fluid resuscitation of dengue fever. If patient is hemodynamically unstable with high hematocrit, so you initiate with two to three boluses of crystallide, if there's no improvement, you switch to colide. If there is no improvement in the hemodynamic state, it is essential to consider that severe bleeding has occurred. Now this uh, continued algorithm of fluid management. Uh, once you have given crystallite, then you have uh, tried colide, and if there is still no improvement, you consider whole blood transfusion of 10 mil per kg of packed cell volume, uh, whole blood or packed cell volume of five mil per kg. Then you must consider giving IV fusamide midway between the infusions. It's important to consider that all the policies, blood, oral fluids are included in total fluid calculation to avoid the risk of overloading. Infusion rate of total fluid should vary from 1.5 to 7 mil per kg per hour, keeping an eye on degree of plasma leakage. Urine output should be looked at and it should be kept between 0.5 to 1 mil per kg per hour. If heading towards fluid overload, restrict fluids. Switch to colides. If it is needed, as high rate of crystallized cannot be continued for longer hours, and there is risk of uh, pulmonary edema. If patient is not improving, again consider complication. So this is uh, a quick uh, table of algorithm of fluid management in critical phase. So it's the same which I have described earlier on. If there is uh, probable shock, you give two, three boluses of normal saline and 10% dextrose. If condition is not improving, you go for colides. And if even with two, three boluses of colides, patient is not improving, you think about complications and blood or back cell transfusion. This is a calculation of uh, fluid for a patient whose weight is 50 kg. So again, as I said, first 10 kg, 100 mil per kg, second 10 kg, 50 mil, and rest of the weight, 20 mil per kg. And 
5% of body weight, 50 ml per kg. So this will be the total amount of fluid which should be given in 48 hours. Indication of fusamide, it should be given midway in the infusion of colides in patients who are already in overload or who are likely to be overloaded depending on the previous fluids given. Midway between blood transfusions in patients with less than 0.5 per Mil, 0.5 mil per kg per hour of urine output despite receiving plenty of fluids and having stable BP and pulse during recovery phase when there is pulmonary edema or fluid overload. Platelet transfusion. At the initial phase, the platelet drop of 150,000 per millimeter cube to 100,000 per millimeter cube is due to bone marrow suppression. But later when it drops below 100,000 per millimeter cube, the cause is increased platelet consumption and bone marrow becomes hypercellular at this stage. Profile excess of platelet transfusion is not indicated. It has not shown, it has not shown any evidence to reduce the bleeding outcome in dengue hemorrhagic fever. When platelets are low, uh, you may need to give them, but in very exceptional cases, like when you're uh, planning a surgery, there is DIC or there is intracranial hemorrhage. Tachycardia is an important sign which you should look for and you should uh, correct pulse rate with the fever. Each degree Fahrenheit of body temperature rise will result in 10 beats per minute of pulse rise. So if tachycardia is more than that adjusted for fever, you need to consider there is shock coming on, there is bleeding, there is impending respiratory failure, and there could be hypoglycemia. There is very limited place of dopamine and dibutamine in dengue hemorrhagic fever. They may do harm than good by giving a false impression about blood pressure. When using, you need to make sure that there is enough intravascular volume shown by increased central venous pressure. Now, if there is prolonged untreated shock, what is the prognosis? If 10 hours untreated shock, death is imminent. If four, more than four hours of untreated shock, there could be liver failure, prognosis will be 50%. If there is two organ failure, liver and renal failure, prognosis is only 10%. If there is three organ failure, liver, renal, plus respiratory failure, prognosis is a miracle. Convalescent phase. Then, now there is no need of IV fluids. Hypervolumia may be present and may require diuretic therapy. Hypokalemia should be corrected. Platelet count will increase followed by leukocyte count increase. Hematocrit may drop further due to resorption of extracellular fluid. Convalescent pruritic rash on extremities is a sign of relief for the doctor. Now, when to discharge a patient? If a patient is afebrile for 48 hours without antipyretics, there is stable general condition and vital signs like pulse, pulse pressure, no or minimal visible bleeding in last 24 hours, no dyspnea or respiratory distress, full recovered organ functions, ALT, AST, normal levels and serum creatinine less than 1.5 mg per deciliter, stable hematocrit for at least for 24 hours and rising trend in the platelet counts of more than 40,000 per millimeter cube. Now, at the end, uh, I should recap on don'ts of dengue infection. Do not give aspirin, ibuprofen for treatment of fever. Avoid intravenous therapy before evidence of plasma leakage or hemorrhage. Avoid blood transfusion unless indicated. Avoid giving steroids. There's no use of antibiotics. Do not change the speed of fluid fast, either increasing the speed or decreasing the speed. Avoid insertion of nasogastric tube to determine concealed bleeding or stop bleeding by cold lavage. It could be hazardous. Now, do's of dengue fever. Do tell patients when to return. Do recognize the critical period. Do closely monitor intake output white sign and hematocrit levels. Do check for earlier leak phase by doing ultrasound. Do recognize and treat early shock. Do administer colides. To give PET RBCs or whole blood for clinically significant bleeding. Now, how can you prevent this? Obviously, it is transmitted to the mosquitoes. So, all anti mosquito measures which are possible should be applied. 
avoid open stagnant water in and around the home, bed nets, long sleeved clothing, in house spraying of insecticides, repellents used on the skin, and there is a pediatric dengue vaccine which is allowed in some countries. It is valid for 9 to 16 year old children with confirmed evidence of previous dengue infection. Its name is Denguexia and is administered subcutaneously. It requires three doses for full protection and it, which are given six months apart. So zero, six and 12 months level, you can give them. But you need to have a confirmed evidence of previous dengue infection. And then they, that child is traveling to an endemic area. These are the breeding places of Aedes aegypti, flower pots, any tanks, buckets full of water, stagnant water on the rooftops, and natural habitat like bamboo stems. Now they, these are common mosquito breeding ground with a natural container and artificial container. These are the references of my webinar. Thanks very much for staying with me. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, we have very uh, thankful for your participation and uh, very You're nice welcome. lecture and especially the management of the uh, dengue fever. Uh, I was not expecting that such uh, dengue fever can occur in cold areas like uh, Aptabad, Mansara. Uh, we were thinking that this is the disease of our Multan, our Lahore, but uh, very strange. Yeah. Uh, that yes, still very there strange. It's, a, yes. it's contrary to uh, the if, temperature of Aptabad. Uh, the, well. If any question, if any, if you have any question, Rashid yes, has uh, I'm Dr. Ashton Amud. Uh, Question, please. Gigi, please go ahead. Achha. Uh, uh, two questions hai. Main beech mein ek, uh, mein disconnect ho gaya agar aapne batai bhi hai, to zara dobara bata uh, ek question hai, CBC mein mean platelet volume jo hai, wo uski kam kam ho to ho ya zyada ho raha ho, to uska kya prediction hai aur kya management hai? Mean platelet volume ki kya importance hai? Uh, plated volume or plated count? I think we go uh, for plated count. count. Volume, volume, MPV. MPV, mean, uh, plate, mean plated volume. Wo CBC mein I'm, likha hota hai. I'm, I'm not aware of that, uh, what role that platelet volume has got. I am aware of platelet count. So obviously to look for the platelet count uh, changes, you have to have serial blood counts. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, aware okay. of platelet volume so, in fact. Uh, 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 that was if MPV is a good prognosis. If it is a good prognosis, if it is a good prognosis, it means it is not going to be a good prognosis. It means that it is a platelet count is low, or MPV is uh, probably this is. So it is first uh, sign of increased production of platelets. MPV Obviously, it is directly related to the platelet count as well. I have a question. 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 I have that is uh, that has got antiplatelet effect as well, so that should be avoided. That steroids have avoided. got a similar sort of role. Uh, for uh, so if fever is not if fever is not controlled with paracetamol maximum dose, then what? Co cold sponging? Then the, then the, not kare? cold sponging. Cold sponging is bad, uh, banned in worldwide, so it is tepid warm water sponging. The neem garam pani hai, the tap water hai, usse sponging karte hain. Dr. Rashid, cold sponging jo hai na, wo bana kiya jata hai. Ah, ban hai sari duniya mein ban hai swai pakistan ke swai pakistan mein maine abhi recently ek emergency mein karte hue dekha ke thande pani se to i was astonished so maine isliye question raise kiya ki isko fir kya kare to uh, tap it off you remove excessive clothing sirf uske upar vest aur ek share kar dein aap share kar dein uska okay ji is like 
Sorry, say that again. Can I share? Kar. Okay. Madam, ये जरा अनशेयर करें ना जरा बस ठीक है जी मैंने कर दिया राइट तो उसी चीज़ कंटिन्यू हम कह रहे थे मुलाजम साहब बस ये चीज़ मुझे क्लियर कर दें कि ये इस डेंगी में एस जी पी टी जो है वो ज्यादा हो जाता है कई मरतबा तो वाट अबाउट पैरासीटामोल अगर एस जी पी टी ए टी थोड़ा ज्यादा जा रहा है नाइन्टी तक हंड्रेड तक जा रहा है तो पैरासीटामोल उसको और चांसेज हैं कि ज्यादा तो वट टू डू अबाउट दैट पेशेंट I think this SGBT and SGT derangement is usually in the critical phase, or which is also called defervescence phase, where fever has settled. So, us waktak aapko paracetamol ki neeri khatam ho chuki hogi. I don't think this has got any effect on SGBT and SGT. Ji, Ammu, mere ek question hai. Hamesha dengue ka kaha jaata hai ki dusri dafa agar dengue ho, to that is more dangerous. ये दूसरी दफा से क्या मतलब है कुछ महीने बाद या इवन सालों बाद अगर हो इवन सालों बाद विद अनदर हेट्रोटिपिक वायरस नॉट द सेम स्ट्रेन ऑफ द वायरस व्हिच वाज फॉर द प्राइमरी प्राइमरी इंफेक्शन इसका प्रोफेसर सलमा कौन दी ऐसा है कि अगर एक नस्ल का वायरस आया है तो अगर किसी दूसरी मसर का डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ डेंगी वायरसेस इन पाकिस्तान अगर कोई और नस्ल का आ जाता है तो दैट इज द उसका वो होता है तो उसका डेंजरस होता है लेकिन इसको का क्या कहें कि पाकिस्तान में एक ही किस्म का डेंगी है और जो बार बार उसको फैलाता है और वो हकूमत ही डेंगी है जो फैलाती है और उसके साथ कुछ और नस्ल नहीं आती इसलिए आप और मैं कुछ जान से महफूज है अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह लेकिन सर जी कुछ तो होना चाहिए ना एक मच्छर इतना हैवक क्रिएट कर रहा है उसकी रेडिकेशन के बारे में हकुमते वक्त कुछ नहीं सोचती इस मास्क को कंट्रोल ये जो आज मैं आपको बताऊं ये फोग है वही कैन कंट्रोल इट अगर ये ग्रीन हाउसेज और ये इसको कंट्रोल करे ट्रैफिक करो कंट्रोल करे अब इसका जो ये फॉर्म जो थे हमारे लाहौर के ये सारे आबादियां बन रही हैं बेअंगम सी और इसको ट्रैफिक को कंट्रोल नहीं किया जाता अब उसकी सजा ये है कि पिछले आप इमेजिन करें कि मुल्तान का सफर तीन घंटे का बस सात घंटे से अभी मुल्तान नहीं पहुंचा इसको भी कंट्रोल कर सकते भी कंट्रोल एनी अदर क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर अयूब डू यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर शादिया डू यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर बहुत अच्छा लेक्चर बहुत अच्छा लेक्चर समझ आया मेरा ख्याल है मुझे तो कोई क्वेश्चन नहीं है थैंक यू सो मच बहुत शुक्रिया प्रोफेसर यूब And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amreen Sultan. And uh, over to you, Professor Sharma, for the to conclude today's session. And it was really very nice. Or my safari didn't even know that one hour I was going to be there. Thank you so much, Doctor. Over to you, Professor Sharma, for the. Thank you very much, Professor Malazam Sir. Um, Dr. Amreen Sultan, it was a great lecture, and you are a great teacher. Because just there, so just in that, you have explained us. So it has stayed in our minds. अल्लाह पाक ऐसे मोजी मरजों से सबको बचाए क्या बच्चे क्या बड़े क्या बूढ़े आमीन और अल्लाह हमारी हकूमत को भी ये खैर से अकल और शूर दे के मच्छर के ऊपर काबू कर ले एक ना बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हमें आप पहच करके रख देता है एनी वे थैंक यू फॉर टूडे एंड आई थैंक ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट संडे को टाइम निकालना बहुत बड़ी बात होती है थैंक यू अमरीन आपने इतनी मेहनत की Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, Pakistan Zindabad. Thanks. Thank Allah. you so much, Pakistan Zindabad. Allah.